Hello and welcome to the ACS to ICE migration video tutorial. This is part one of the three part series that would cover the overview and the planning for the migration. In the overview I would cover basic information about all the three different parts of migration which would be the planning, preparation and the migration. However, this video tutorial would be focused more towards planning section. There will be two more video tutorials that will be made for other sections. Now, ACS to ICE migration could be a very important and complicated topic as well. So, please put your pen down and avoid taking notes. Please pay attention to all the details and information provided in this video tutorial. Now, this information is already made available in the how to doc which is also available in the community site doc 65715 my name is Krishnan Dhruvengadam I'm a technical marketing engineer from the policy and access team now as I mentioned earlier the migration consists of three different sections planning preparation and migration the planning would cover all the top of mind questions and information on how to design your topology based on your environment and your device administration model and how to convert your ECS deployment to ICE deployment. The preparation would cover all the nuances related to tool and it will also give you information where to go in ACS and ICE to actually configure or monitor the success of the migration, the location of the configuration and any exceptions that come up in the migration you can go and fix it. It will provide all the details of that and it will also cover uh, information related to staging your environment. The migration part would cover the actual migration process that includes the migration tool, an overview of the tool will be given and it will cover three sections exporting the data from the ACS, analyzing the data for any policy gaps and importing the data to ICE. All these three sections would be covered in the migration and finally how to verify your configuration that has been migrated. The first and top of the mind question would be what do I need to know to migrate my ACS deployment to ICE? This video tutorial would be covering in detail all the basic information that you need to plan the migration. So as you see here, ACS feature comparison and the migration path has been asked many, many times by many people. So they need to know what is a feature comparison and what are the underlying hidden differences that is not perceptible. For migration path, people ask questions all the time. How do I migrate my 3x or 4x ACS deployment to ICE? Or how do I migrate 5x? To the later version to ICE. And for people who are new to ICE, I have included the deployment consideration section that will give you the differences between ACS and ICE deployment. Now having known all these basics, then we will take a deep dive on the topology design, like if you have TAC hacks and if you have radius, based on the device administration model and based on the performance metrics of uh, TAC hacks as well as uh, radius there will be deployment options provided dedicated deployment or you can have dedicated PSNs with shared PAN and MNT so once you learned how to deploy your ICE and how to move your ACS to ICE deployment based on your environment and the device admin model then we will see how to 
scale your PSNs and things that you need to know to scale your PSNs. Say if you have a certain environment and if you we need to know what hardware you need to use and how many PSNs you need for radius and tack acts. All this information would be provided. And finally, how to do your MNT sizing based on your log needs. Right? You need to size your hard disk and you need to order hard disk. You need to order a certain platform or appliance or VMs, right? And you need to uh, it'll provide all the information later to us. And then finally we will summarize uh, what we learned from this video tutorial. So the first topic in the planning section is the ACS to ICE future comparison. Thomas Howard has created a nice community link for this topic. And I have updated this page with the latest and greatest information that is already available in the how-to guide for migration. So this link would be the go to place for any ACS to ICE feature comparison. Let us briefly look at the different sections before we actually open up the community page. The limits would be talking about the, de the deployment limits. The feature section would compare the underlying features listed here between ACS and ICE. This would include ACS 4.2, ACS 5.7, ICE 2.0, and to one for the features listed below. Let us take a closer look by clicking on this link. The limits would provide a comparison chart of deployment limits between ACS 5X, ICE 2.0 and ICE 2.1. From the table you can see that the maximum number of nodes supported in a deployment for ACS 5X would be 22. For ICE 2.0 and ICE 2.1 it is 44 and 54 respectively. There is a big difference between the number of endpoints supported in ACS 5X and ICE 2.0 and 2.1. ICE 2.1 supports up to 1.5 million endpoints. As for the number of users, ICE 2.1 supports up to 300,000 users and has a parity with ACS. When you look at the number of network devices supported, it's 100,000 in ACS and uh, it is now 100,000 in ICE 2.1 as well. The number of network device groups is still need to be looked into and uh, we have brought this up with engineering as well. In ACS it, it supports up to 10,000. In ICE uh, we support up to 100. Those are the important ones worth mentioning. For other features, please take a look at the community link. Let's go to the feature parity, feature differences. Right, in radius all of the features are now supported except for Leap Proxy. Leap Proxy will never be supported. For TACAX, IPv6 is not in and um, that might come in the later release and it's not being planned for the next release. In Identity Stores, we are planning to support LDAP server specification per ACS ICE instance in the next ICE release. So the, in the internal user and administrator section, most of the functionality has already been supported. And the user change password utility is brought up and, uh, and it is one of the features that's not planned for the next release. Group mapping will never be supported uh, because this functionality can be configured using inline um, authorization condition in the authorization policy. Network access restrictions is planned for the next release. Configurable radius ports is, as well, is planned as well for the next release. So does the maximum concurrent session per user group. Logging to external DB may not be necessary because uh, we are planning to enhance the logging capacity of ICE in the next release for radius and TACAX and make it more dynamic. And these are all are just planned, not committed. 
so this goes with a caveat saying that uh, please don't uh, bring it up if it is not in the next release and these are the things that was brought up based on um, customer feedback and uh, feedback from partners and this has been planned RSA token caching that uh, is planned for the next release dial in attribute as well is planned for the next release user defined attributes for endpoint is also planned for next release so let's go back to our presentation we will be covering performance a little later in this video tutorial once we cover the top of the mind questions and some of the deployment options so the next thing in your mind would be okay so I know now what is a feature parity and the differences between ACS and I's what are the hidden differences and which are not perceptible right one of the main differences is that uh, ICE has tighter name validation which means uh, a valid name can uh, contain alphanumeric hyphen and underscore a typical valid name a complete list of ACS configuration and its equivalent in ICE along with the naming constraints and how to fix it is provided in the preparation section of the how to guide for the ACS to ICE migration right here if you see in this example and this is a screenshot from the migration tool itself the users have special characters such as slash which is not supported in ICE so does network devices for the network device we we don't support uh, special characters however dot is supported in ice 20 patch one of the patches and in ice 21 as well this information is also available in the configuration maps and you can look at the configuration maps in the preparation section of the how to guide the authorization pro profile and other objects that are part of ACS will also have different naming constraints in ICE. Let us continue our discussion of hidden differences between ACS and ICE. Custom condition. This is implemented in ACS in the form of a button in the identity and the authorization policy. However, in ICE, the implementation is totally different. You have authentication and authorization condition, which is part of the regular inline policy conditions. Right? You can uh, open it and take a look at the different attributes that are supported in ICE and take advantage of that and create custom condition based on that. Policy format. This is, in fact, in a tabular form in uh, ACS and it also supports hit counts so if a traffic hits a certain policy then the hit count increases this is not available in ICE the hit counts are not available the policy tables are in a slightly different format it's not in the format of tables any longer network conditions also called network access restrictions this feature is planned for the next release of ICE and this can be created as part of the authorization condition using different attributes of ICE. Let's take a look at some of the unsupported rule elements in ICE a little bit once we understand more about the top three. So let's first talk about the custom condition, right? So in ACS, if you actually go to the authorization or the identity policy, you can see that there is a customize button to the bottom right corner so when you click on this customize button you will be able to customize the condition and move the condition from left to right so that these appear in the tabular column above it also shows the hit counts in the same tabular format let's take a look at what ICE provides in a little bit but before that we wanted to remember that these conditions will have a comparable condition 
in ice. The condition that is highlighted here are 81 external groups, network device group using device type, and was machine authenticated. Let's see how to create these condition in ICE using inline condition. So in ICE authorization policy, you go to the policy set and uh, you can see that these conditions can be created in line. 81 has external groups and uh, you can also see the was machine authenticated equals true and the device type equal all device types. So these are the conditions that are already available in ICE and ICE has tons of attributes as well. You can take advantage of the the number of attributes in ICE and uh, use that to customize your inline conditions. Now as part of the unsupported rule elements there are a couple of things that you might need to know. In ACS, ACS provides a combinatorial operation of AND and OR. You can also group them. So you can see that the internal group users OR NDG location is grouped and the internal users using user identity groups is grouped again. So both these groups are combined using the AND operator. In eyes so far, we only have we only have either and or or. However, this might change in the future, and uh, we have plans to include the combinatorial operations in the next release. Eyes also does not support date and time in its policy condition. There are other unsupported operators in ICE that are supported in ACS. For example, in ACS, you have in, not in, contains any, and contains all. This could be replaced with starts with, not starts with, equals an or, and equals an and. So if you actually look at the drop down box in the condition for the authorization policy, you can see the different operators that are supported in ICE. Fantastic! Now that we have covered the feature comparison as well as uh, some of the hidden differences, that would answer the top of the mind question for anyone. Right? The second question would be what is the migration path? And if you are migrating from uh, uh, the later version of ACS uh, or the older version of ACS, right? So ACS 5.5 and 5.6 can be migrated to ICE 2.0. ICE 2.1 supports migration from all the f last four versions of ACS. Now if you are using an older version of ACS, ACS 3x or 4x, I have a blog which is created in the community site and you can go to the community site and uh, uh, type in uh, ACS to ICE migration. You will see uh, the page and if you want to migrate ACS 3x and 4x and please take a look at this blog. This will actually uh, give you insight on uh, whether you want to migrate or whether you want to do a clean install. Whether to upgrade, migrate or to do a clean install is always a big question especially if you're using an older version of ACS. So if you want to migrate from uh, ACS 5x, 4x to ICE 2x, you always have to recommend the best possible option to the customer given the nature of the customer environment and the complexity. So if you are migrating from 5x to 2x, it is actually a two-step process. You have to migrate or I'm sorry, you have to upgrade from ACS 5x to 5.8x, which is the latest version of ACS. I would recommend ACS 5.8x because that is the only version that is active out there. All the other versions of ACS, the BU, have announced end of life. So once you upgrade over, then you have to migrate from ACS 5.8 to ICE 2x. So it's a two-step process. 
If you are using a slightly older version of ACS, you have say ACS 5.1 or 5.2, then you need to do an interim upgrade to an ACS 5.4 and then upgrade over again to 5.8. If you are using uh, ACS 4x, I would recommend a clean install. ACS 4x to ICE 2x is a two-step process migration. You have to migrate once from ACS 4x to ACS 5x and then you have to migrate from ACS 5x to ICE 2x. There are big architectural differences between ACS 4x and ACS 5x and ACS 5x has policy differences between ACS and ICE. In ICE the policies are flat. In ACS the policies are more hierarchical. So there is no guarantee that the data would be carried over between these two migration. So the advantages of time savings and cost outweighs other concerns such as the system is being older or they have undocumented configuration or the system is not being touched for a long time. Right? You can also take snapshots of the UI, the ACS UI and uh, use this to configure ICE from the scratch. So clean install is the best path going forward if you're using ACS 4X to ICE 2X. Having discussed about the migration path from uh, ACS 5X and ACS 4X, the next obvious choice would be to talk about the end-of-life consideration so that customer can uh, upgrade to the latest version of ACS before migrating to ICE. Now this chart would give you in the end-of-life uh, information. As I mentioned earlier, 5.8 is the active version. All the other versions we have announced end-of-life and you can see that most of the version is end-of-sale and uh, some of the older versions 5.5 five and below is end of life. The oldest version 4.2 and 3 are end of support as well so if you have customers on 4.2 and 3.3 three, please migrate them ASAP. That's mainly because uh, ACS 4.2 is supported in a very old version of Windows platform which is not supported by Microsoft and it, this, it's open to all different vulnerabilities out there in the, for the Microsoft operating system. So please migrate them over ASAP. Now having talked about the top of the mind questions, let's um, talk about some of the deployment differences between ACS and ICE and this is for people who are new to ICE right and they they have already an ACS deployment and they want to know how to deploy ICE. Now ACS has a primary and a backup setup. Similarly ICE also can have a primary and a backup setup for redundancy. However all the functionality are separated in the form of personas in ICE. So you have the administration persona, monitoring persona, and policy services persona. All these three personas can be in the same box or can be split into different boxes. Different boxes in the sense different individual boxes of ICE. So the admin persona takes care of the administration and management and configuration and uh, it synchronizes with all the different personas or the nodes in a uh, topology. The monitoring is mainly meant for logging and troubleshooting. The policy services, we call it a policy services node. The policy services persona is the heart of the ICE deployment which responds to your radius request and the TACAX request. It also speaks to your Active Directory LDAP server for authentication. It talks to your external identity store. All this is performed by the policy services node. So that is the workhorse of your deployment. So ICE can be deployed in different ways. One is a standalone as we saw earlier. The second one is a basic distributed deployment. Say if you have two data centers right, and you have a high speed link between uh, two data centers you could have in one data center an admin MNT node co-located 
and for redundancy you can have a secondary node and you can have a bunch of policy services node cluster and this cluster is mainly useful a cluster is a service uh, that's within ICE and is mainly useful for better data replication this is again useful for uh, services such as profiling and everything so all the different devices, different NAS, such as your ASA, your wireless controller, and your switches will talk to these policy services node. And uh, the endpoints behind these nodes will be able to authenticate. So in case of TAC hacks, then all these devices would be managed. And uh, the authentication server would be the PSNs. So this is a fully distributed setup where you split your deployment and you have dedicated PAN and MNT and you also have dedicated PSNs. You could have dedicated PSNs or you could have shared PSNs between Radius and uh, TAC Axe, which we will look at it in a bit. And there are latency requirements here. In ICE 2.0, the link latency is 200 milliseconds. In ICE 2.1, it is 300 milliseconds. This is specifically for radius. For attack hacks, it can be relaxed a little bit. So once you understand the ACS and the ICE differences, the next thing is let's take a look at uh, attack hacks first because uh, a lot of customers a lot of ACS customers use the TACAX service. And uh, the approach towards TACAX is two prong, right? One is human admins. I used to be a system administrator, and all I did before joining Cisco was logging into uh, the network devices and performing certain commands and look at the results and make sure the results are valid. So those are human administrators. And for example, like you know, if you look at the performance for human administrators, say for 20 device admin running one device, one command per second, the performance would be 40 transactions per second. The next would be the scripted device admin. So if you have a large number of network devices, say 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, you might not be able to scale based on uh, manually performing device administration. You need a scripted or programmatic way of logging into these uh, devices. Many big customers use this scripted device admin model. And of course, there is a combination of human and scripted device admin, which a lot of large customers use as well. Now, having said uh, having spoken about these two different models, let's take a look at uh, what are the deployment options you have based on these two models. Remember, the deployment option is also based on the services you need for your customers, right? So there are two different uh, services, Radius and TACAX. So the first question is, should Radius and TACAX coexist in the same deployment? Or do you need separate deployment for Radius or TACAX? Right. The first model we will discuss is the dedicated deployment. The pros of the dedicated deployment is it offers complete separation of both the TACAX and Radius. And uh, this is typically used in an environment where two different groups manage these devices and uh, it offers complete independence of managing these two. It also is used in an environment where authentication performance is a high priority or if there is a high profile user needing quick access to network and you don't want your device admin to uh, uh, interfere with uh, these high profile users. The disadvantages could be if you have two different ICE deployment, then you have to incur additional cost to manage and maintain. And it also adds cost to have a separate PAN and MNT for your second deployment. Typically, bigger customers using scripted device admin model use this type of uh, deployment because it gives complete 
and total cost of ownership. The second type or the second deployment option would be dedicated PSN. Now this also gives centralized policy management however the PSNs are separate. The PSNs are separate for RADIUS and TAC hacks and this is typically used where you have a combination of human admins and scripts. So if you use uh, scripts extensively in your environment, use dedicated deployment and if you use scripts sporadically, use dedicated PSNs. We will take a look at it later. We will take a look at it in a bit how to choose a particular deployment. So the disadvantage of the dedicated PSN is that the per PSN utilization for radius and tack hacks could be low or you might need additional PSNs based on the geographic coverage you need for your customer. The third deployment is the integrated deployment where you share all the boxes, the PAN, MNT and the PSNs for both RADIUS and TACAX. This is a highly optimized environment and it offers high flexibility and uh, you have centralized policy and uh, monitoring as well. And this is typically used in an environment where you do not have any IT requirements for authentication performance or network access uh, specifically and the separation of network access and device admin is not critical. So this is also used in an environment where human admin is mainly used. Right, uh, typically in a small or medium sized environment. So the disadvantage is that like if you have multiple departments or multiple business units managing both radius and TAC acts, you need coordination between them and also you need to understand the load of network access uh, versus device admin and make sure they don't interfere with each other. So uh, having discussed the deployment option, the dedicated uh, deployment, dedicated PSNs and the integrated approach, right? The next logical question would be like, okay, so I know what I wanted to use for my customer, right? Like uh, I have chosen a deployment model, say for example, a dedicated deployment. Now I need to know how many PSNs I need. How many 3495s do I need to buy or 3595s do I need to buy uh, based on uh, the performance, based on the device admin model? Now it is actually a simple three-step process. If you are using TACAX only, the simple and easiest approach is to replace one ACS with one PSN. This ACS I mean is the ACS that is used for authentication. However, if you want to understand the performance impact and if you're an advanced user and if you want to look at the performance metrics and customize your deployment, you have to calculate the transaction per second for the TAC hacks and this is based on the authentication and authorization and so on. This information in fact is available in the how to guide appendix C, right? There are also tables in Appendix B that will provide details and how to calculate the PSN based on the transactions per second in Appendix C. Right? So you have to use both the tables, first Appendix C and Appendix B. I'll give you an example uh, in a bit. And if it is radius only, right, then you have to use uh, endpoints per PSN per deployment. And uh, there is a performance and scale doc that is also available in the community site and that is a beautiful doc and that has all the information pertaining to ICE performance and scale. And that has information on uh, deployment limits, uh, authentication per performance across the platform for TAC acts and radius, the log sizing and all the other pertaining information. Now, 
let's take a look at TAC acts first, right? Like from a performance perspective, and uh, let's take a step by step approach. Now, what is TAC acts? TAC acts has five different events the authentication, session authorization, session accounting, command authorization, and command accounting. Each event occupies a certain amount of a syslog. Authentication occupies two kilobytes. And if you combine all of it, authentication through session accounting, it occupies five kilobytes. And command authorization and command accounting is per command once the session is created. So you can see that it can go up to three kilobytes. Now let's take a look at the use case and let's take a look at an example. Now we have a use case of a customer with a 30,000 network device. The number of sessions per day is four. And the customer is using a scripted device uh, admin model and uses 10 commands per session. Right. So if you look at the message size, and it is uh, five kilobytes based on the authentication session authorization and accounting uh, plus the number of commands per session multiplied by both the command accounting and authorization so there is a little formula to it and if you wanted to calculate the log size it is the number of devices multiplied by the number of sessions multiplied by the message size which comes to four gigabytes per day for 30,000 network devices. Awesome, right? Now we know the log size. We also have an idea of the nature of sessions and the number of commands and probably we can calculate the transaction per second based on that. The next step is to determine the total load per entire deployment in transactions per second based on the device administration model. Craig Hibbs, our senior TME, has created a fantastic table that I will be using for this video tutorial. He already had shared this during the CVT if you have attended the last one. Now this table would give you information about the average transactions per second, the peak transaction per second, the log logs and the storage used per day right and uh, this is for both the human admin model and uh, this table is based on 50 admin sessions per day and the device admin model based on four scripted sessions as we saw in the use case and 10 commands per session now uh, the table are the table is split into two parts and the first part in the top half is for the human admin and the second part is for the scripted device admin now again the table is divided into three different sections so if you are using session authentication authorization and accounting only then you'll have to look at this section of the table if you are using command accounting only and then you have to use this section if you are using the whole nine yards where uh, you enable authentication, session authorization, accounting, command authorization and command accounting, you have to use this part of the table. Going back to our use case, our customer was using 30,000 network devices. And for 30,000 network devices, if you turn on all the events and logs, the transactions per second, the peak transactions per second would come to around 2.3k, which is 2300 transactions per second. Right, and you also see certain areas in which are highlighted in red, and this means that if you have a logging requirement that exceeds a certain limit then um, you will have performance hits in MNT so this is typically between 2 million records to 2.5 million records and if you have more then uh, you might need an external logging server such as Plunk or any other system 
and you might want to have uh, logs forwarded to the East logging server and configure ice based on that. Now having determined the peak transactions per second, let's go back to the different models that we spoke about earlier, right? The dedicated deployment model, the shared deployment model, and see and determine how many PSNs you need, right? In a dedicated uh, TACAX deployment, TACAX only deployment model, you can see that for 2300 transactions per second, you might need slightly more than 23495. So you can see that the maximum dedicated PSNs, it can go up to five maximum PSNs, out of which two is recommended. And you can see the maximum TACAX sessions or transactions per second. The maximum is 5000. However, with two PSNs, you can have up to 2,000 transactions per second. You have three choices here. You can go with the 3495, which means you might need more than two. You can go with 3515. Again, you might need more than two, maybe three, right? And uh, you can also go with the 3595 in that case, and you can stick with the uh, to 3595s. Uh, remember when you are uh, setting these things up and also take into account the future needs and uh, calculate your PSNs based on that. What we talked about is for the basic distributed uh, model for ICE. If you go with a fully distributed with the separate admin and MNT nodes then you can see that the 3595 might fit the bill with two boxes supporting up to 3,000 transactions per second. If you go with the 3495 again like you might need more than two boxes. In a fully distributed deployment exceeding 15 to 20,000 transactions per second will cause MNT performance hits as shown in this table. There is also a reference given under this table that has full platform comparison. The table below gives you the scaling per PSN and it uh, also uh, gives you an idea of maximum transaction per second support per platform. So for a dedicated deployment based on this table we need up to two or three PSNs depending on the hardware to support 2300 transactions per second for our use case. Now let's take a look at the shared deployment. So a shared deployment is where you you share the radius and the TACAC services. right? In the shared deployment you can either go with an integrated approach where this is shared in every box, the radius and the TACAC is shared in every box including the PSNs. Or you can go with a dedicated PSN approach where you have dedicated PSNs for radius and TACAX. However, the PAN and the MNT is shared. Right? Again, this has three different options based on the deployment model of ICE in a standalone. By default, it is integrated model. So that's why the maximum transaction per second is 50. And you can also see the maximum radius and points supported for 3595. It is, uh, it is up to uh, 20,000. In a basic distributed deployment where you have admin and MNT in the same node, for an integrated approach, it supports up to five PSNs. For a dedicated PSN, you can have three radius and two TACAX nodes. Right. So you can see that for the 3595, right, like you have three radius and two TACACs which is supporting up to 20,000 radius and points and uh, up to 1500 T plus PSNs, TACACs, PSNs, 1500 uh, transactions per second for the TACACs PSN. In a fully uh, distributed approach, you can uh, see that 
for 3595 you can have up to 48 PSNs for radius and 2 PSNs for tack ax based on our simple calculation. Right, and it can support up to 500,000 radius and points. The maximum transaction per second supported in a dedicated uh, PSN, TACAX PSN approach is 3,000. For our use case, and you can see that like in a fully distributed approach with a dedicated PSN will be a better bet. If you want to choose basic distributed deployment, as you increase the number of dedicated PSNs for TACAX, reduce the number of radius PSNs and the number of endpoints supported in your deployment. Right, so the 3595 with fully distributed deployment fits the bill for our use case. Again, the table below would give you information how to scale your PSNs based on radius and uh, tran TAC -AX transactions per second and this is per platform 3415 through 3595. This is fantastic, right? Now we have the clarity of the deployment option and we also have the clarity how to scale our PSNs and what are the options we have and how many PSNs do I need However, we've also seen that MNT takes performance hits if the log exceeds a certain limit. So, configuring MNT for special logging needs and log retention becomes important. And that'll be our next step. How do I size my hardware for my MNT? This is again based on a few steps. First, you have to understand the number of sessions used by the customer. Say you need to talk to the customer to find what type of device administration model the customers use, whether it is a human admin, whether it's a scripted admin, and try to determine how many sessions they use uh, per day and uh, what are the commands per session and so on. That will give you an idea. Uh, what is the log sizing? and you also need to know if there are any radius services running and uh, how many endpoints you use for the radius. Now once uh, once you have that and then you have also determined what TACAX events you need. Right, like you know there are different events, authentication, session authorization accounting, command accounting authorization and so on. So based on that the log size might increase so you need to determine that first and you also need to have a knowledge of the customer audit needs if there is any right if a customer has an audit need of 30 days of log retention or 60 days or 365 days whatever it might be you need to know this information to size the MNT hard disk uh, and you can also supplement your MNT logging with an external syslog server if the logging requirements of your customer exceeds the limits as shown in the tables we've seen before. Finally, once you have clarity and answers for all the items that we discussed before, all the three items listed here, then you can look at the Appendix C in the How to Guide available in the community site for ACS to ICE migration. This information is also available in the ICE performance and scale guide, the link for which is provided in the slide. Based on these tables and the reference material provided, you can calculate the hard disk size for your MNT. Here's an example. If you have TACAX and um, if you need a log retention of uh, so many number of days, you need to use this table. For our use case, right, you have the number of sessions 
per day is four, and for 30,000 uh, network devices, and we have calculated the log size of four gigabytes per day, right? Now, based on um, based on that, and if you have a 30-day log retention need, the MNT disk size you'll have to choose is one terabyte. It's simple, right? So we have this beautiful table, and it presents everything that you need from a log retention, log sizing standpoint. We also have a log sizing calculator, and this is for advanced user. And you can see on the top, and there is a link for ice MNT log sizing calculator. And you can tweak it, and you can uh, you can use it uh, to your own advantage. And uh, this uh, is also available in the community site. And you can download it, and you can use it for both radius and tack hacks. Now this is for the scripted device admin model they, where customers are using a programmatic approach. If a customer is using a human admins, right, you can see that uh, for 30 human admins, right, the log retention capacity seems significantly higher than the device admin model as you can see from this table. So if you look at the log size for 50 admins, it is 85 megabytes per day. So for 30 admins, it'll be approximately 52 megabytes per day, which amounts to 1.5 gigabytes per month. So our original scoping for the device admin model with one terabytes capacity will be sufficient to hold this as well. This is when we extend our use case that we discussed before, the customer use case, to support both device admin and the human admin model with a log retention capacity of 30 days. For the radius log retention, and we also have a table, let us make our customer use case a little more interesting. We had TACAX device admin and human admin model to the use case and uh, understood the log retention needs and the requirements for both. Let us add the radius services to the mixture and look at the radius log retention capacity and the needs for the customer. We have a nice table that describes that. This table shows the log retention in terms of days for a number of endpoints. Right, The number of endpoints is there to the left and this is across different MNT disk size. So for our calculation if we use a custom disk size of 500 gigabytes as shown above the maximum allocated MNT table space for radius is 120 gigabytes. It is important to remember that the table space is not shared between radius and tack axe and both are independent. So the log retention needs and the MNT log capacity for radius will not impact tack axe and vice versa. Currently the allocation of MNT table space is done statically. However, we are planning to make it more dynamic in the next ICE release. Right. So the log size per day is calculated using a simple formula here. And based on this formula, if you plug in all these parameters, adding radius service to the customer use case that we were discussing with 100,000 endpoints and 30 days log retention, you need a custom disk size of 500 gigabytes. So let us summarize the customer use case that we have discussed so far. For a customer requirement of 30,000 devices with a scripted device admin model of four sessions and 10 commands per session, and maybe if you add uh, 30 human admins with endpoints using radius services in the back end, right, like say if you have 100,000 endpoints, based on the discussion so far, the best design option is to go with a dedicated deployment model with ICE basic distributed deployment or 
a fully distributed ICE deployment. So the platform options for TACAX are three 3495s or three 3515s, or you could have two 3595 or an equivalent of uh, hardware f in case you are using VMs. In case of RADIUS, you need five 3595s for to support 100,000 endpoints. And you need up to 10 3495s if you're still using 3495s. Remember 3495 uh, we have announced end of life and it'll be good to upgrade your customer over to 3595 platform. The MNT hard disk space uh, we have seen that we require up to one terabyte of uh, MNT hard disk space. So there you go. We have designed the new ICE deployment. We also acquired a good knowledge about ACS to ICE migration basics, comparison of ACS to ICE in terms of features, in terms of underlying differences, what is expected, and so on. The next step is to prepare your environment, which means you need to set up your staging environment, install the migration tool, uh, go through uh, some of the processes, uh, understand uh, some of the migration tool requirements and needs that will be covered in the next video tutorial. Last but not the least, I've included some references for ACS to ICE migration. I've also briefly discussed about licensing, enough to get you started in the next slide. The licensing section covers the ACS licensing frequently asked questions. This link is available in the community page and this community page covers all the different questions that comes up as part of ACS licensing including links for ACS ordering guides also called bulletins. The ICE ordering guide will have information about the specific SKUs required for migration between ACS and ICE. If you open up the ICE ordering guide, the migration appliance ordering information would provide ordering details for physical and virtual Cisco ICE migration appliances. In fact, if you are migrating from physical to virtual, it says that you can replace the existing legacy appliances on a one-on-one -on -one basis using the SKUs provided in table 4 as shown in the screen. And you can also migrate physical to virtual or virtual to physical whatever the case be. So please take a look at the ICE ordering guide and order these uh, migration SKUs. Essentially for ICE you require a device administration license. It's a perpetual license. You also need a hundred base license. So you can see that the license package for device admin has required licensing for device administration and you need to add on the base licenses. And this comes with uh, the SmartNet and SASU support contracts and this is tied to ICE appliance um, SmartNet and SASU support contracts. So all this information is uh, available in the ICE ordering guide. For the migration you need to be aware of these three docs how to migrate ACS to ICE and that is the how to doc that uh, uh, this tutorial is based on. There is an ACS to ICE migration community link and that will provide some basic information on the migration. It's a very good link to use if you're just looking for answers to top of the mind questions. The ACS versus ICE comparison would compare ACS and ICE features, limits and performance which we have seen in the start of this video tutorial. The ICE performance and scale is a very detailed web page that has information about ICE deployment limits and scale based on the number of endpoints, platform comparison in the form of tables, log retention and log capacity for radius 
and attack hacks in the form of tables as well. It also has uh, protocol performance for radius and tack hacks and much more. It has links to the high-level design documents for ICE as well. This concludes part one of this video tutorial that covered planning section of the three-part series for ACS to ICE migration. In the next two video tutorials, I'm planning to cover preparation and migration. Thank you very much for listening. For any questions, you can ask questions through the community site or create a discussion. We'll be able to answer via the community site. Good luck in planning your migration. Please look out for the next two videos for additional details about ACS to ICE migration. Thank you.